Hi, everyone. So this is the workshop on self-sovereign identity. And I've, I've just listened to the previous workshop, which was excellent, by the way. But um, this one here is, is going to be slightly less technical. So we're still going to see a lot of code. But because self-sovereign identity is a concept that does lend itself to some confusion, and there are a lot of false uh, beliefs out there, I'm going to spend a little time on, on theory. So I'm trying to make that as practical as possible, but, but please bear with me and, and don't lose patience if, if you're expecting something very uh, hands-on. We will get to that in the second part. So um, OK, before we start, um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Stefan Bayer. Uh, I'm, I have a background in distributed systems research, and then I moved into cyber security. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Cryptonics in, in Europe. And uh, I'm also the lead auditor for Solidified, which is a smart contract auditing company in, in, in the USA. So I specialize on security, uh, and particularly in cryptonics, we specialize on what we can do to make blockchain more secure and cryptography more secure, and the other way around, right? What blockchain and cryptography can uh, provide to make applications more secure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Signal, which is our platform, which is in the very early stages, but we're developing this platform for uh, self-sovereign identity. But but I, I won't tell anything about products and, and businesses and things like this. I'm, I'm going to show code examples on how we, 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 we actually implement a real um, self-sovereign identity application and how we can make that uh, useful. So here we go. The goals of this workshop are quite simple. So first of all, I want to clear up some misconceptions about self-sovereign identity. I want to talk about some standards that are emerging. And, and then I want to show how we can actually be practical and turn standards into something useful, because standards are quite heavy and they are quite difficult to interpret, and sometimes not as practical as we, as we would like. And, and then we want to explore some use cases, right? We want to see what can we actually do with a self-sovereign identity. And that part will include coding examples. So just to start with a bit of background, digital identity is obviously a problem in the internet. And that's because the internet is very old, uh, well, reasonably old compared to other things, right? So the internet was built without a way to know who and what you are connecting to, as something Kim Cameron once said. And, and he's, he's quite well known in the self-sovereign identity space. Um, but but you know that, that it's what he says it's true when the internet was first invented nobody thought about some of these use cases we now have and identity and the way of authenticating uh, and dealing with certain things uh, was never you know was, was added to it as an afterthought and that led us to a certain messy situation so identity is very easily explained by this triangle here right Usually there's a person, a device, an object of some sort, some entity that has an identity. And there's an issuer of a credential and there's a verifier of a credential, right? So someone says something about someone else and we have to trust this, right? Like that something else might be, you are allowed to use the system. You're registered in our uh, access management system, uh, something like this. And someone else or, or a program or device is verifying this and so that, that that simple triangle with these roles never changes in, in identity management that's the basic of it all and this is where one of the misunderstandings with self-sovereign identity comes in because we, there's still always some trust involved right we always need to 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 believe someone uh, about who about the credential who, who issues a credential um but i'll say a bit about this later so so when when people first tried to implement this triangle they, they came up with this uh, central login type of scenario right i have a username and a password with some company server and I identify myself uh, by providing this username and password right so that, that's what we call centralized identity management don't want to spend too much time on these because it's very straightforward right 
But then at some point we, we realized that was very inefficient. We needed to have a, a username and a password on so many system and you, you all know that's a nightmare to manage and, and we're still suffering from this today. Um, but then, you know, we came up with things like federated identity management, where we have a, a third party provider of our identity. This is your typical log on with Google, right? So I can use Google or Facebook or some other identity provider for that they have an identity service as part of their service offerings and, and they can just log on to a service using google and then there's some redirecting going on behind the hood google actually authenticates me and, and issues some sort of session management uh, or, or you, know, I, you know i get something back from google and, and i can use that to identify myself on the, on the website i'm trying to connect to uh, and then i just need one uh, identity for a whole number of services. Now, of course, that's still relatively centralized and uh, it only alleviates the problem of me having to remember a lot of passwords, but it introduces other obvious problems. And when we when we take decentralized identity management, we, you know, well, the, what self-sovereign identity is about, we, we, we get in a new paradigm where we've just replaced this third party identity provider um, with a distributed ledger. Uh, actually, that's a spelling mistake, a distributed ledger, but well, it doesn't matter, it, uh, a blockchain, right? So we still have an issue and we still have a verifier and we still have the individual, but the, the difference is the individual has all the data locally, doesn't have to have stuff on, a, on someone else's server, uh, at least, not, uh, you know, it's not obliged to, can do that voluntarily, but the data and the identity is controlled by the individual. But we still need to trust the issue of a credential, right? Uh, so if someone wants to verify using a self-sovereign identity that he's over 18 years old to buy, for example, alcohol over the internet, um, we still need to trust some government or, or some KYC provider or, or someone there to verify, to issue the credential that this person is over 18. It's just that this fact doesn't have to be stored for everyone to see, right? I can just prove that from my own identity wallet. That, that's what self-sovereign means. It doesn't mean uh, like in the world of cryptocurrencies, you know, we're replacing the banks. Uh, we're not replacing governments to have our own passports. Uh, we're replacing the way our data is managed. Um, and that, that's pretty much summed up in this overview tape. So we have these identity models, centralized, federated, and decentralized. The technologies are evolved, as I said, passwords and IDs. Um, in the centralized model, we can do things like multi-factor authentication for security, maybe kind of single sign-ons, but, but we still have our identity fragmented across many different systems, and, and, and these enterprises control our data. Uh, and the centralized data is always a honeypot for, for cybersecurity related things. Uh, in the federal use case, it, that's still the case, um, but we have uh, less fragmentation. Everything else remains the same. Uh, well, there's a certain worst case scenario, one provider going down can just destroy our identity of a whole number of services at the same time. So in terms of a honeypot for centralized attacks, it could be even worse. And then in the decentralized scenario, we have our data in our identity wallet, be controlled by the user, and we make extensive use of distributed ledger technology, blockchains, and cryptography. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on talking what a blockchain is because everyone on this call and this conference knows this. Uh, but I just want to clear up uh, some misconceptions, which are very important to understand how identity works on the blockchain, right? And, and I want to go back to the basics. And again, apologies if this is too basic, but if, you know, even some very well-funded projects get this wrong sometimes. Uh, I want to talk about what problem a blockchain solves and particularly what problem it doesn't solve. So, and that directly translate what we can do to identity on the blockchain. So, so we have a ledger and it's distributed over a number of nodes. We all know that. But there are some properties we want to guarantee, right? All copies of the ledger are exactly the same. There's no coordinator. Everything is immutable and it has to work when the participants are not all honest. 
And in the case of an open blockchain, a public blockchain, anyone can participate. So all that's very clear and it gives us certain things, right? It gives us a unique version of history, a mathematical foundation that can replace trusted third parties and we solve the double spending problem. That's all good. But a lot of projects claim it can do more, right? So blockchain cannot provide extra privacy. It can, of course, implement privacy solution on top of blockchains in certain ways, but we can do that without a blockchain, right? Blockchain by itself doesn't add extra security. We have to do a lot to do that. And um, it's not easy to interact with external data and devices, That's something called the Oracle problem. Performance is generally decreased a lot, uh, and we cannot store large amounts of data, at least not compared to centralized solutions. Um, but what is very important is that data written on a blockchain is not automatically true, right? I, I can write on the Bitcoin blockchain right now with a little script that the sky is green, but that doesn't make it true. And that's something that is often misrepresented in, in some of these decentralized application projects, right? A, a blockchain just maintains integrity of data. It doesn't make the data magically true. That, that's very important to remember and it applies to identity. So the blockchain works by representing digital ownership, right? We have an asset, some type of asset that might exist in the real world or not. And we represent that on the blockchain somehow. And that representation is just a token, a number, whatever. It, it's some identifier on the blockchain, which is controlled by a cryptographic key. So the key component we use to represent digital ownership is public key cryptography, right? Someone has a private key that controls a public key to an account, or sorry, that controls a, an account, uh, which has a public key, obviously. And, um, and that we use to model ownership. And that asset we have down there in, in this picture is the Mona Lisa, but it might well be an identity, right? So it doesn't have to be a cryptocurrency or anything that of, of a real world value. It can be something more abstract, like an identity. And that's very important to remember. It all works by having this public key infrastructure. So everything we do with self-sovereign identity could be implemented on a centralized system, centralized system with public key cryptography. Of course, we would lose the self-sovereign aspect. We'd have to, tr to, to, we would have to trust a, a service provider of this public key registry or, or whatever you want to call it. And that's very important to realize. We can all do the, all this without the blockchain. It's just that the blockchain gives us a, an advantage that we don't have to trust the centralized party to do that. Uh, but we're not issuing, we're not replacing credential issuers and, and people that, that verify that we are over 18 years old and that we have a certain nationality with self sovereign identity. We just uh, abstract this data away into our own we con uh, ownership wallet. We control this data, right? Uh, and we represent a, a reference to this on the blockchain, uh, which is just a public key, really. So private key ownership is equal to an identity proof in this model, right? Whenever we want to prove who we are, we have to sign something with our private key or prove something else with our private key uh, or related cryptography, cryptographic primitives, right? The data is controlled by the identity owner in self-sovereign identity, and the data is secured in what is called an identity wallet. Uh, and it would probably be better to call it an identity vault, right? Because it has our credentials in there, it has all our private data in there, and we just submit proofs of these to whoever we want to verify something to. We can, of course, choose to disclose our data, right? But it's up to us. That's a big difference. Um, but these verified credentials that we store in our wallet, they are still documents and things, claims over our identity that are issued by a third party, right? So that's, that's important to realize, right? We're not self-proclaiming our identity. We create our identity, we create the keys that controls our identity, and then we can do with that whatever we want. But but if we want to, to use it to, 
to identify ourselves as a as a US citizen, for example, we, we still need uh, someone to, to, to issue a claim, which is a verified credential on this citizenship. Right? That, that doesn't go away in self-sovereign identity. And, and that's this same, what I've just said, drawn in a diagram, right? So we've got an identity owner who owns an identity which is represented on the blockchain. And in a bit, I will show how we can implement such an identity on the blockchain. And I have some off-chain credentials in a world. And it's a verifier uh, that is trusted, that trusts an issuer of a credential. All right. So this a credential claim can be on chain, a claim on the blockchain, or it can be in my off chain credential walls, right? Can be issued either on chain or off chain. Obviously, for data privacy, off chain is uh, preferable, but there are things we might want to issue directly on the blockchain. Um, and we can verify this, right? So verify, I can verify openly any claim over my identity on my identity that is on the blockchain, or he can get temporary access uh, to my off-chain credentials vault, or I can prove something about my off-chain credentials directly to the verifier uh, using something like a zero knowledge proof or a digital signature. And, and we'll look at these uh, in a minute in, in more practical terms. So the layers of this are, are really these, right? Uh, we have decentralized identifiers, which are often called DIDs or DITs. On top of this, we usually have some way of authenticating ourselves, and then we have verifiable credentials that say something about ourselves. Now, obviously, the order of these layers is not that clear because an authentication credential is a type of verifiable credentials, really. But, but, you know, uh, it's nice to paint it like this in three layers and it's easy to understand. So in order to be useful, self-sovereign identity only makes sense if, if everyone uses the same way of dealing with identities. And, and there are some standards emerging and, and there are a lot of standard groups. And I've actually tried to work with the W3C and and uh, they have some very competent working groups but but um obviously these things take time and the standard is still a moving target right there's a standard for decentralized identifiers and there's a standard for verifiable credential and then a whole suite of standards that, that, that are related to this uh, and they're all still work in progress uh, they're making good progress but it's taking a long time and being practical uh, Everything I present here is a snapshot from maybe a couple of months ago and, and might well have changed by now and will change again tomorrow, right? But, but the idea is we, we start from standards and then try to be practical about an implementation. Uh, there's also something emerging, which is called the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework, which is an attempt of the European Union to build on top of W3C standards. Uh, and that's in line with E. E-I-D-A-S, however that is pronounced, I don't know. It's a, it's a legal framework for digital identities that is already in place. And, and there's similar things like this all over the world, and it remains to be seen what becomes a leading standard. But the W3C standard is always a good place to start. And the way they represent DIDs is very simple. Um, a DID is what we can see here on the left, right? It, it's like a URL. It's it's identified by DID as a scheme identifier, and then we have to specify a DID method. Method. So DID method is a way of interpreting a certain a DID, uh, and it's it, it's written up in a DID method specification, and um, and after that there's a, a method specific string. So it's not as interoperable yet as you would have liked. If I want to write an identity wallet. I have to support different uh, version of these different did methods, or at least you know I have to pick one, and 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 obviously that's an interoperability issue because I have to implement software to deal with each of them. But at least you know it's a way of you're receiving a string, uh, you know what it represents, and you can pull in the right library and you can you can deal with it uh, somehow. Um, but anyway, there's something called a did method specification. And that 
uh, tells us how to interpret this string. And something that they call a resolver in this uh, standard translates the string into a DID document, which is really what a wallet should store, which is nothing more than this JSON document here on the right. And everything is express, expressed as JSON. You can store it whichever way you want, what you want but in, in the standard that they use JSON to as an interchange format. So that, that has first a context here, which just links to the version of the specification. Then it has the identity itself, which is this DID string, which we had on the left. And then there are a number of things which are really uh, objects representing public keys, right? So there's a method of authentication, authentication uh, specified here, which in this example here is an RSA key. Right? It's a key of type RSA verification key 2018, which is some standard, I suppose. And then there's a controller. Right, so someone controls this identity uh, and there's a subject, right? So that's a bit of terminology from the specification, from the standard. You have a, a subject, which is the person the identifier or the DID identifies, and there's a controller that controls it, meaning has access to modifying the data and, and that sort of thing. Obviously, uh, in an ideal self sovereign identity scenario subject and identify sorry subject and controller are the same person right um, but that doesn't have to be like this right there are uh, situations where we might create a digital sorry a decentralized identifier for someone on someone's behalf uh, register some keys do some things with it and, and then transfer it to him uh, right, so that, that that scenario is is possible, and, and at the bottom here we we can see some services uh, which are used to retrieve verifiable credentials. Right, you can say on this endpoint we store certain uh, credentials, uh, and you can do other things. But but the standard is quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, but but you know this is just a, an example copied directly from the standard. Credentials are similar. There are a JSON document. Uh, again, there's a context. And, and you know, the, the one that I copied here from the standard document, again, is an example that shows a university decree issued as a credential. So it links to an issuer um, and it links to the subject. There's an issue date and there's an expiration date. And very importantly, Below, there's a proof which is submitted here, but this proof can simply be the digital signature of the credentials issuer, right? So everyone I send this to, and of course I wouldn't do that, you know, in like an email or something like this, I would do that through my identity wallet. Everyone that does that, that receives this type of document, can use this proof to verify who signed it uh, uh, and who the issuer of this credential is. And obviously, that cannot be tampered with because it's a cryptographic signature of this very credential. So, if you have a standard like this and you want to do something practical, you, you are left with two choices. You can either wait until the standard is finalized. Um, if any web company will, if most of the web companies had done that, we, we'd, we'd be nowhere right now. So, so, so most people, what they actually do instead is that they they go ahead, take whatever is useful from the standard, and start implementing stuff, uh, which is what 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 we've done. We've taken um, the, this and we've uh, started to build a platform which we call Signal, which is in the very early stages, but it's a platform. Uh, with a very simple self sovereign identity management solution. And on top of this, we are building a number of enterprise services for our clients. Now, I don't want to go into the services and, and, and into our business model and, and all these things. It's not a sales meeting, it's a technical workshop, right? So I'll show the open source part, uh, or at least the demo version of what we are planning to release open source soon. Uh, and we'll show you how we, can, how we can work with this to build interesting applications. 
So the, the user level services eventually will be obviously authentication. Right? That's a, sort of the basic service you have to provide with an identity management system. Uh, you know, authenticate who, who you're dealing with. That's very important in all identity solutions. We want to have a secure data access delegation mechanism, you know, like a vault, encrypted vault, where you can give someone temporary access to certain data. We have document timestamping, uh, digital signature platforms, um, certificate issuance, you know, like these credentials for university degrees we've seen before. We have uh, some e-voting prototypes we, we, we will eventually develop into products. And, and you know, in general, we can deal with private co uh, contracts between companies and between individuals using their identities. And um, I'll say a little bit about this, but um, in, in, with implementation examples. So as I said before, we need a, a Signal DID method, all right? We need a method specification for our way of interpreting in, uh, interpreting the uh, ideas and um, someone just asked for the link to the repository I, I'll provide this uh, at the end if I don't just remind me but but everything will be provided to you it's public um, so okay so our signal did method it's very simple, right? We identified it with the signal string. So everyone who receives the strings will know it's a DID. It's a signal method. We registered this with this W3C in the temporary uh, um, registry. We have to fulfill a certain format, but, but it's very easy to register this right now because the standard is not finalized yet. Um, and then we have to identify a network, which is uh, the Ethereum main network or the Rinkeby test network or, or some other Ethereum compatible network. Everything we have now is built on Ethereum, but it doesn't have to be, right? The, the actual on-chain layer is so lightweight that we can easily replace it with something else. And then there, there should be a 32-byte hexadecimal string, uh, but because our wallet is not finished uh, in, in what I will show later as usage examples, it's just replaced by an Ethereum address, right? but it's a hexadecimal string. That's an example here. There's um, basically the, the, the did document this resolves to has this identifier here, and it has a number of keys. The first public key here is just the Ethereum address itself, right? So that can be used already for authentication, for signing, for a number of things. It's of type, uh, oh yeah, sorry. It's of type uh, SecP two six two five six K one couplets, which is just the way you know what, the curve used by by Ethereum, Bitcoin, and a number of other blockchains. But it could easily be something else like Edward curves or things like this. We, we can register other keys in our system, and then there's a controller, and and, and obviously the Ethereum address is, is the equivalent of the public key. I know it's not a public key, it's a derivative of a public key, but it's, we, we, in this case, in key number one or, or the first key, we, we use the Ethereum address. And let's say we want to turn a, a did method into code, right? So we need to identify some components to this. So, so we have a did registry which lives on the blockchain. And that just lists a number of DIDs, right? And the keys to, are split, obviously. The public keys belonging to a DID live in the smart contract. They're listed as public keys. And the private keys live in the user's wallet. And there's a controller and a subject. And hopefully, in a real self-sovereign identity system, they are the same. But they don't have to. Um, and there's a resolver here, right? That resolves any DID into a DID document. Now, if we want to implement this in code, we have a choice to put the resolver into the smart contract, or we can put it into a library. We've chosen to put it in a library simply because there's no point calculating stuff unnecessary on chain. Uh, the smart contract contains all the information necessary to derive the DID document. So let's do that off chain. Right. And 
an identifier itself, the ID has certain fields, right? So it's a data structure. It's an ID, a DID data structure, which obviously has an ID, which equates to a subject usually. And, and there's a controller, there's a creation time, and, there are, and there's an array of keys, right? There's a list of keys. And these keys have a type, and then they have the actual public key string, and then they have a purpose. Now the key purpose we put in there because we might have keys that are solely used for signing and some that are only used for um, uh, things like authentication. Right? That, that, that makes sense because in some applications, well, in most applications, it, it, it's best to avoid signing uh, and doing other stuff with the same public key. Right? So depending on which, cryptographic method we use, which, which, which crypto system, it might be a bad idea to use a public key for encryption as well as signing, because yeah. it might leak certain information that we will don't want to leak. So that's why we have this purpose field. And, and now we will just switch over to the implementation demo. So hopefully you can see my... Um, uh, my editor now, you probably see this very small. I try to make it a bit bigger. And um, this is uh, directly from our repository, right? So, so we have this hard hat project, uh, which has a number of smart contracts and, and a few library scripts and, and, uh, and example scripts. And, and it's really a very simple smart contract, right? We have something called the DID registry, which is just an Ethereum contract uh, using Solidity 0.7 here. Uh, anyway, the contract starts here. And the first thing you will notice is that we have a struct here, right? For, um, for those of you that know Solidity, that, that should be very easy to read. Uh, for those of you that come from other programming languages, it should also be relatively straightforward, right? It, it, it's, it, it's literally a struct with some fields. And um, basically we have a controller address, we have a time created and we have a time updated timestamp field. Uh, and then we have an array which can hold keys, public keys that is. And these keys can have a purpose, right? So there's a, a enum type for this authentication, signing, encryption. Right. Um, and the key is again a data structure, right? So public key has 65 bytes. We could optimize this in having the X component, the Y component, the 32 bytes each, and then the prefix, which is always uh, zero, four hex, I think, uh, could go, uh, and that would be faster. But anyway, I think this is more this is clearer in terms of code uh, and then we have the key purpose here so that's all the data we need to store there are no other data structures apart from this mapping here which maps our subject to uh, to the ids right so so each subject has one of these the id structs attached to and these the ID structs contain an array of keys Put a limit in here, max 32 keys, just because it doesn't make too much sense to have that many keys, um, but that's arbitrary chosen, right? And there's some events. There's the only controller modifier because only the controller of the ID is supposed to do certain things. And then we do stuff like create a DID, right? So this is your register and identity, create a new identity. And you do that for subject. So if the subject is the message sender, then the controller is actually the, the subject itself. Otherwise, it's some other Ethereum address. Uh, and then just we have some block timestamps here and we emit an event. Deletion is obviously the opposite. Only the controller can delete an entity. And then we have some getters and setters, which are fairly straightforward. We can set the controller 
which basically means we, you know, we can change the controller and only the current controller can do that. So that's a way of, let's say, I create an identity on someone's behalf. I, um, I, I, I can just transfer this to, to them, right? It's very easy to, to, to transfer the controller address to the subject itself. And then we have these art keys where we can just register a key. In this simple example, it's just these uh, simple Ethereum style keys, right? Uh, the Bitcoin keys, Ethereum keys, whatever you want to call them. They use this elliptic curve here, but it's trivial to add other types of keys and we will do that. Uh, and you can remove a key, which basically means you revoke a key that might have been compromised or it that might have been um, well, just not useful anymore. And that's good practice to occasionally change keys for certain things. And of course, having identities with, which can have different public keys and different private keys obviously associated with them means that we can, um, you know, we can have different keys for different services and purposes, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, and we can even have different identities. You could create a, a separate identity for separate services if you don't want to associate uh, certain things with each other. And well, there's some getters here. You can get the, the key at a certain index, and, and you know, it's, it's all optimized for for doing more stuff off chain rather than on the blockchain. And obviously, in terms of gas, we only have a cost involved when we create an identity or add and remove a key. Right. Whenever we just verify something, we, we, we only read from the blockchain. We don't have to execute a transaction. And, and yeah, that, that, that's a practical example how we can turn a complex W3 specification into something actually useful, right? A standard into, into very simple implementation. Uh, if we want to use this, We've, we've obviously got a, a small library, which is in, in, in lib here, but all it does, it uses Ethos JS to, to, to interact with our smart contract. So I don't want to go into detail of that because it's, um, uh, you know, it's not a class on how to use a tutorial on how to use Ethereum. Uh, that, that, I take that as a given. So, so in this example here, we just created that here, the ID. Well, first we, we deploy the contract because it's a hard check, hard type project. We so it's all locally simulated, uh, but here we start to create the ID, and we get a controller back. Then we can generate some keys. So we're using this um, elliptic curve uh, cryptography library here to generate a private key. We derive a public key, and we add these, uh, and then we just resolve the ID. And if we try that here, if I type, um, so it's a hard type project, so I have to type mpx hard type run and run this example script. It should deploy all this, register the ID, and get me something back. All right, so we've now resolved this simple DID, which I, I created in the example script. So we have one public key here, uh, which is the Ethereum address itself. Then we have another public key. You notice a difference here. This is a full public key, whereas this is just the Ethereum address, which is derived from the public key. But the second key we registered here manually uh, is uh, well, it's actually a 32 byte, 256 bit elliptic curve public key. And then we have a key here that is supposed to be used just for authentication, right? So they're separate because they're marked differently. So we've got three keys, two we added and one which is the default one for the Ethereum address. So, That's that's that. Let me just try to go back to the. Uh, how do I go? Uh, 
it's just a second this my screen has frozen i'm trying to get the okay here we go okay so sorry i was trying to get the presentation back uh, here we are now, now we've got the ids right we've got a way of we have a self-sovereign identity that a user can create now importantly we are still lacking a wallet so so it's a we, it's all a bit manual right now in this example but um we we can actually use this right and and we simplified it a bit so that we can use it with metamask right now but but eventually we, we are current well, we are currently building a signal wallet to 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 deal with more complex dids but 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 anyway once we have done this we can we can use this for authentication and um, someone is asking for the url i'll just quickly type it up in the chat as well but it's difficult to multicast this i really need an assistance but it's signal.io um there's not much on there just a landing page and a really uh, ugly demo but 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 anyway feel free to have a look so there's a once we have the ID, the obvious things we want to do is, is authenticate ourselves with a, with a decentralized identifier, right? So let's talk a little bit about authentication. And um, the standard way which we authenticate ourselves with most services is just the username and password, which which has obvious problems, right? So so. This has been going on for 50 years now, 70s, I suppose, or even earlier, but logins were always usernames and passwords. And we, we've sort of optimized this in that now passwords are stored on a server in a hashed and sorted way. And that should be relatively secure, but we still have to trust the server to do this properly. We have to trust the employees that run the server not to intercept the password because it has to be sent to them in clear text. And on every login, we need to send this password across the network, which obviously means we require a secure channel. And, and that's not ideal, but we've, we've, you know, we've been managing this since for 50 years. So uh, that's the way we work. But now that we have the ideas, we have this fantastic cryptographic system, a public key infrastructure, and we have signatures, right? So now that we are talking about cryptography, we have to take account into account tradition and talk about in terms of Bob and Alice, right? Otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So Bob can now sign a message, which can be any message with his private key. And Alice can verify with Bob's public key that the message was really signed by Bob. So Bob has proven that way his identity and, and we can use this to log on really. So if we do that to log on, the advantage is we don't need to store a password anymore. We don't need to trust the server and we don't need to trust the communication channel anymore because the message doesn't matter if it's intercepted, uh, right? Well, it does in a way, right? Because there's still a problem. Alice only knows that Bob has signed the message. She doesn't know anything else about this authentication attempt. So the message can really be reused or the whole signature can be reused, right? If was always there as well in cryptographic examples. Uh, is an eavesdropper, and, and she can just capture this this signed message and this signature and, and replay it, right? Used to impersonate Bob. And there's an obvious solution to this. It is to make the message unique, right? Uh, for example, using a nouns. So the first message is one, the next is two or three, which is the way blockchains generally solve this problem for their transactions. Each account has a noun, uh, which is a number used only once. Um, or, or we can have another way of make this message unique, uh, which is that Alice actually issues this challenge to Bob, right? Issues uh, Alice tells Bob which message he has to sign as a challenge. Bob doesn't know this in advance. So at this moment, only Bob can sign this message. So that, that avoids this replay example. And that has led to another standard or a proposed uh, standard, which is called DIT auth, or more than a standard, it's like some you know, word people use for authenticating themselves with the IDs. And there are several ways of doing this. It's not really 
that prescriptive. But the, the main thing is there's a, a 1.2 message in, rounds involved. Now, instead of just signing username and a password, I sign a, a pre-authentication message which says, I'm Bob, I want to sign on. And then Ellis issues a challenge. I sign this challenge and, and I get a cryptographic token, a JWT or a session management thingy, what, 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 you know, whatever method you normally use to manage uh, sessions, authenticated users is valid, but, but you, 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 you get the picture. You get something back after the second uh, message, which is a signed challenge. And we've implemented this, of course. I'm going to show it as well. Um, so we've got this thing here, Signo or demo, uh, which is, um, well, this is what it says on the box. It's a demo for our authentication method. And um, it, basically it's, it's an express, a node express application. So again, this is not a class about node or express. So I don't want to go through the whole thing. It, it's fairly, easy, but um, we have a front end and we have a back end right, to, to simulate this in the server. And, and we serve a number of routes, right? And we serve two routes now for authentication. We serve pre-authentication and then we serve authentication. And, and that will become obvious now when we look at the controllers, right? So we're doing a, a pre-authentication here. Uh, for some reason, my computer slows down a lot when I share my screen. I don't know why, but um, yeah, here we go. So we've got a, a pre-authentication resolver here. So we get a pre-authentication uh, request, which just takes the ID from the message body. And that's this part here. And um, then we, we create a, a random 64-byte long string. Or oh, well, 64 bytes of random a uh, random number, random bytes, and we 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 hexify this. We turn this into hex string, and we we issue claim, and we we create a JW2, the token. Um, if you don't know uh, about JWT, well, Java, uh, sorry, JSON Web Tokens, that they um, they are way of, of uh, signing or encrypting. Well, not encrypting, but to 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 issue certain tokens that, that cannot be manipulated uh, cryptographically. And, and, and we just send this back to the, to the origin of the request, right, which we do here. And uh, on the front end, I now receive this and I make an authentication request, which is served here. And um, what that does, it you know, it reads the token, it checks for some things that it's correct, it's a valid token and these things, uh, standard uh, uh, web stuff. But but basically, we get the signed message out there. We perform some basic checks. Let's uh, make this a bit bigger that you can see the whole line. Well, you can't, but but it's it's an obvious check, right? that it's not a null message, that, that everything is fine. And then we, we just get the address from this. We, we use the ethos library to verify the message and, and we, we get a result. We get the did from our register to make sure we know we are, who we are talking about. We're using the, the, the first public key for authentication here in this case, which is just the Ethereum address itself. And um, then we perform some checks, right? We want to make sure that it is a user that, in, that is authenticated in our system. And now we just accept any DID, right? But we make sure that it matches the DID that made the, the pre-authentication request, because that's obviously the message that needs to be signed. The challenge that needs to be signed is the one we sent in reply to the pre-authentication request. So all these checks are in here. And we, we either re reply with authorization successful or unauthorized right, in this example. Now, if we wanted to, to have some 
additional controls on authentication, you know, we can do whatever else we do. We can have a white list of what this did can have access to. We can have a database. We, we can have many things. Um, but we know who we are talking to, right? So there's a difference between authentication and authorization. In this case, we just know who we are talking to. We're, we're not deciding yet what you can access. But let's just run this, right? So let's go to the terminal here and fire up the server. I need to change directory. Sorry, the screen sharing thing is actually covering up what I'm typing, so I'm a bit slow. Um, I run this before, so yeah, it's just that with npm run serve, and if I remember correctly, it serves on port yeah port five thousand. So let's open up our browser again. Get out of full screen. And let's go to localhost 9000, 5000. And this is a really complex user interface, which we spend a lot of time optimizing. <laughs> it, it doesn't do much, right? <laughs> it just has a login button. But I can now use my DID, which I created before to save time to log on, right? So if I press log on here, my MetaMask will open up, right? So the pre-authentication has already gone out and now I have a message to sign. If we really want to do this properly, we have to go and we should really use one of these standards to make it a human readable message, but we haven't done so, so we're just trusting this and signing a hex string now. And I've authenticated correctly, right? And, and I've actually reserved the DID here. It says in this alert that pops up who I am, just for a dramatic effect. If I change my address to one that doesn't exist as a DID here in MetaMask, uh, just use this second account. By the way, I'm on the Rinkeby network, so, so this is not my real ETH, right? So don't get excited. It's uh, everything is on the test network. But I'm not. I'm not spending gas anyway right now. I'm. I'm just verifying things and signing messages, right? So it's important that this doesn't have any gas cost. So I sign with a DID that is not registered, and I get an authorization was not given, which is wrong because it should say authentication or not authenticated or something like this because a lot of people confuse authentication with authorization. But but anyway, it, it works, right? So let's go back to this. Um, this is very nice and much better than passwords and, and usernames, but it still has some minor issues. Um, it's not ideal for all use cases because there's a, still a privacy thing, right? Uh, Eve can read the message if the channel is not secure and can resolve the signature herself. And then she knows that Bob has interacted with Alice. Can't do anything else, but you know, something about the interaction is leaked. Right? So there's some privacy leaked. And, and, and obviously, since we were trying to build something that doesn't need a secure channel and is very robust and privacy or focused, we, we don't want that to happen. What we really want is this, right? We want Alice to be able to issue a challenge to Bob that cannot be traced to Bob or Alice at all. We want Bob to compute the knowledge of some private information, like a private key, right? And send that proof to Alice. But that proof, importantly, has to be something that cannot be traced back to Bob. And then Alice can use some public information about Bob, something like a public key, to verify the proof, uh, again, without leaking any information about Bob. So that's, of course, a zero-knowledge proof. 
right? So again, I'm not going to talk much about zero knowledge proofs, but it turns out that some signature schemes actually have zero knowledge properties, right? So with no signatures, which are, are slightly different uh, than the, the signatures used by Ethereum or Bitcoin uh, normally, you, you can actually implement a zero knowledge authentication scheme, the math of which I copied onto the slide. Uh, it's, it's not math that is beyond the average developer, right? It, it's relatively easy to understand and follow this, uh, but I'm not going to go into this in, 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 because it's not the purpose of this tutorial. And, and we, you know, we could spend a whole day on zero knowledge authentication itself. Um, but anyway, it works and we can implement this and, and we've done so very easily. Um, well, we've done so very easily by using someone else's library, but I'll, I'll show that now. So in here, uh, let's kill this server first. Oops. And what was that called? Um, okay. So in okay, in here we have something called a, a zero knowledge authentication registry, which is not a smart contract, and it could really be part of the main DIT registry. You know, we could store everything we store on here in like the other smart contracts, but we don't. Uh, we kept it separate. Uh, and it's very easy, right? It's just got a mapping between an address and a string, and we call this credentials. And what it really is, a credential is uh, a string which, in con which contains some details that doesn't leak much information or doesn't leak any information about Bob really, but it can be used to, to calculate, to verify a, a credential, sorry, um, a zero knowledge proof issued by Bob. And then obviously we have a set credential which Bob can use to register himself and we have a get credential which a verifier can use. So very simple code. But it becomes interesting when we go to the CKS NOR example JavaScript file here, um, which again just deploys everything. So that's the boring part. But this here simulates a user and an issue and a verifier, sorry. Um, uh, and, uh, a user and the verifier in the same uh, process, but really this would again be a backend service and some front end system. But we have a secret here, which is our very secret string, which is like a password, right? And oh, I forgot to say, we are, we are using a library here, which is new ID CK, which is new ID, new IDs implementation of uh, CK SNOR identification schemes. Right, so that, that's a very good library and it's it's open source. So feel free to have a look at it. We are just using it. We haven't invented this. Um, so anyway, we use this string we have used as a secret to create a, 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 what, what is called a verifiable in the language used by this library we use. And, and then we use that to set, to calculate the credential which we store on the blockchain, right? So here we store that on the blockchain. And the verifier can just use this, right? So the verifier can, can, can recover this. Um, and can you know does some string processing to turn it into the forward we need but basically it can use it to issue a challenge right so now we've got a challenge and ideally here we would send this to the user of our network we don't have to because we are in the same process for demonstration purposes but the user gets this challenge string and uses it to create a proof turns this proof into a string and sends it off. So all the zero knowledge magic is hidden from us, right? It's done by the library, but we're sending a zero knowledge proof across 
to the server. The server, which is the verifier, uses this to verify the the proof. And then obviously, you know, if the user is authenticated or not, depends on if the verification succeeds, if this computes correctly. Um, so this script doesn't do much. I can run it. But in this case, it just it takes a while because it has to deploy the smart contract locally. But it, it you know it, it comes back authenticated. It, it doesn't do much, but feel free to have a look at it it's in our repo and also have a look at New ID, which has some nice services built around their own library. Very interesting project. Anyway, uh, let's go back to the presentation. So we now have very clever ways of authenticating, which is the main use case of uh, the IDs. But once we can do that, you know, it's not enough to just to say who we are. If, if we have an identity on a blockchain and a way of signing things and, and have this public key infrastructure in general, even if we don't create an ID and, and just want to make use of the, the public key infrastructure properties, we can do stuff, right? And, and the first thing we, we, we can do is to notarize a document, which is a very simple low hanging fruit blockchain use case. But if you combine it with the IDs, it can become very powerful. Right. Basically, notarizing a document on the blockchain means we calculate the hash of a document or any piece of data, and we store that on the blockchain. And in the moment it is stored, we, we are obviously creating a timestamp by miming this block. Right? We store the, this timestamp with the record. And we can then always prove that a certain document existed in a certain version in certain in a certain format. And we can we can verify the integrity of this piece of data. And the use cases for this are private contracts, uh, IPR protections. There are many things you can do with this. Again, we have a small, small demo. Um, this smart contract is extremely simple, right? I'm just going to show it here. Um, we just have a record data structure, which has a timestamp, and we've also added a signature, right? So we can actually sign the record as well, uh, because that, that gives us a, a scope for additional use cases, but it's not really required. All we really need is a hash and, uh, and the timestamp. Right. Uh, and then we just have a mapping between 32 bytes, which are the hashes of, of the document to this record data structure. And then they get and set us, right? There's nothing else to it. We, we just store a record with, uh, which is hash really of a data of the set of data. We store that together with a block timestamp and with a signature. And uh, we can use get record and signer in order to recover who has signed this document and when this document in a certain format was uh, was stored. So again, we've made a little demo here, which I have uh, okay, which I've got open here. So again, I, I want to draw your attention to the extremely powerful design, right? It's uh, for demonstration purposes, obviously, so there's not much time is gone into making this look nice. But um, basically the same, right? We connect to the Rinkeby network. So this has just connected to my MetaMask. It didn't ask me, it should really. But now I can just upload a file. Upload is not the right word. Let's say this, this, this logo here, image file. And I sign it, right? So it's all, you can see it's already calculated the hash and all that's done in the front end, right? It's not sent to any server. The data stays on my computer. And, and I can sign the record as well. And then I can store it on the blockchain. Uh, which opens up MetaMask, ask me if I'm happy to spend cash for this. I am because it's Rinkeby. 
And now we have to wait a little bit because this transaction has to be mined. It says pending here, but eventually it should stop saying pending. And here we go. We now have a transaction hash and the record has been stored by me, by my Ethereum address. Now I can just read this record again of the blockchain. And what it does, it does exactly the same, right? I can choose the file. I, I, I read it from the blockchain. For, from the blockchain. And what it does, it calculates the hash. Get goes to the blockchain, get me the record of this hash. If there's no hash there, then it gets back zero. If there's a hash back, it gets back a signature, which I resolve to my address, which is the same that was used for signing above. Uh, and I get the timestamp back, right? Obviously now, 30 seconds afterwards, that's not very useful. But if this was a private contract and they had to prove in court that uh, the private contact has not been manipulated over the years, uh, that, then I could do it uh, with this very efficiently. So this is obviously a very standard use case of a blockchain. It's, it's, it's low hanging fruit as it's often called. But it's, um, you know, just because it's low hanging fruit doesn't mean we don't have to do it. And in Signal, we're actually using it to do more powerful stuff. We, we are using it to implement something which is a, a, a decentralized DocuSign. Right? So you all know DocuSign, you can electronically sign documents on a web interface and uh, it's very practical and most of us use it a lot to, to deal with our clients and to, to, to make deals across the world. But, but it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really do anything cryptographically sound. Well, they, they, they will use hashes and things like this, but but you know, it's it's we have to trust uh, them, and uh, we can just do the same as a blockchain. We can build a system where you can sign with two self sovereign identities. You sign a contract, and you notarize it onto the blockchain, which would be the equivalent to going to a notary service in real world in the real world and registering a document there, which can be quite expensive. Then the next thing we can do and we, we are doing is to issue more complex credentials, right? And this is where the where the uh, verifiable credentials standard comes in. So I've not got a demo for this simply because we are not there yet, right? We are still working on how to make all this work. But once we've got our wallet work, working, you should be able to store credentials in the, in the university or anyone can issue a claim or, or, or a credential or, over someone's uh, identity and, and sign this and, and you know you can store it in your in your wallet. And the advantages of this are obvious. A lot of has been talked about uh, storing credentials uh, or, or, or hashing credentials onto the blockchain and, and using the blockchain as a source of truth. Uh, but but we still need you know, we still need to trust the, the issue of the credentials, right? So if the university of some country or some city uh, issues a, a certificate, we need to know their DID and we need to know that they are really the ones signing it, right? So that, that doesn't go away. We can do things like secure data access. And this you, you will find on our GitHub actually a, a small demo, which I don't want to show today because it will take too much time. But um, we can do secure data access delegation, right? So if we have public keys and private keys, we can have an access registry either on a smart contract or, or somewhere off chain. Uh, and the way we, we, we store our data is we encrypt it with a symmetric key, or some sort of AES key, mm -hmm. uh, standard uh, data encryption. And then we encrypt our own um, we encrypt the key with our own public key, right? So I can use my public um, Ethereum key, for example, uh, to encrypt a, a secret key. And that encrypted version, I publicly store someone and only myself can encrypt it with my private key matching my public key. Now the advantage is if I want to delegate access to this piece of data that is somewhere, I can now just re-encrypt the the secret key with someone else's public key so alice wants to give access to bob 
So she just takes her secret key, encrypts it with Bob's public key and stores it in the registry. And this means that only Bob can make use of this key. Now, the reason I don't want to show this now is that it's actually not that easy with elliptic curve cryptography to do things like this, right? You cannot just elliptic keys are meant to, to be for signing, certainly the type of elliptic keys used in Ethereum. And you cannot just encrypt a piece of data, even as small as a, a, a AES key, uh, easily with the public key. Oh, sorry, for for a public key. Um, you you have to use some tricks like uh, something called elliptic curve integrated encryption scheme, which is a wrapper around this and actually has another level of symmetry keys. But if we abstract all this away, we can have a, a nice public data vault where we give people access to encrypted data at, on a temporary basis. E-voting is another obvious use case, right? Once you have your identity on the blockchain, you can have some sort of KYC system where you match this to a real world identity. If you wanted to, you, know, you could have anonymous voting as well. Sorry, uh, well, anonymous voting in the sense that that, that people are not KYC. Voting should always be anonymous. And then you can do things with uh, verifier credential and voting smart contracts. And there are ways to do this that it's all self telling, telling, auditable, but privacy preserving, right? So there are schemes that you can use um, blind signatures that you actually don't reveal who you are voted for, but you can tally the votes correctly. And I have to admit, this is in the early stages. We've got a few demos up on our public GitHub as well of very simple voting schemes, but the privacy preserving aspects are not there yet because that is proving quite difficult. But there are solutions in, in, in academia and, and there are some libraries that start doing things like this. And hopefully we'll build something very soon. So quite quickly before I end, a little bit about Signal. Um, obviously, at the lowest level, we now have the Ethereum blockchain. It's currently on Rinkeby for our demos. Um, as I said, we're in the early stages. We're not sure where we will eventually deploy it. Uh, ideally, on Ethereum, but gas is getting quite uh, prohibitive recently. Uh, obviously, we only need gas when we create or modify an identity. We don't need to spend gas when we authenticate and do other things like off-chain signing or issuing off-chain credentials. Uh, but still, you know, just for creating a, a, an identity, we don't want people to spend too much gas. So we're still evaluating. Uh, we can easily replace Ethereum with other stuff. Uh, it can run or anything because the the real value is in the standard client, the standard compliant protocol uh, and a set of open source libraries. They're not open source yet, not all of them, just uh, demos are right now, but there will be. And there will be a number of APIs and then our proprietary services, which uh, you know, which people can can pay to use and that they are oriented more to enterprise grade blockchain applications. So the architecture, um, you know, is sort of very high level here and very obvious. And there's a number of smart contracts. We've got a DID registry, a claim registry. We've got time stamping. We've got e-voting smart contracts. We've got access registries for the data sharing. Uh, some of these have to be used, like the DID registry. Others don't have to be used, like the access, access registry you can do somewhere else. Um, and, and there's always layers on top of this, right? So we've got some cryptographic services, notarization service, verifiable credentials. There's obviously our DID method, which is open source. And, and on top of this, we just build different applications. It's a fairly marketing-oriented diagram. This It doesn't go into much detail. But uh, you know, it's, it's still pretty much work in progress. Um, that, that's it. I finished slightly early, so we probably have quite a bit of time for questions, if there are any. If not, I mean, here's the, the URL. Um, there's not much there yet, it's just a landing page, really. But, uh, but anyway, feel free to look at it and talk to, talk to it about us. 
to, uh, to talk to us about it. And you can always also find me on Twitter here. Anyway, questions. One question in the chat, chat what do you think about ESIF? So the, the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework, uh, I don't have too much of an opinion, right? Uh, basically, because it's very difficult to get information. Uh, as far as I can see, there, there is this uh, framework um, in place where you can, whether it's an accelerator program where, where companies can present part of the solution. And we tried that and we, we missed the deadline once and once we were not successful, I have to admit. But during the whole process of, of trying to get information on the European Safe Sovereign Identity Framework, it became clear to me that it's very early stages, right? And, and, and you, you, it's not clear what it will look like, or at least the last time I looked at it, it wasn't clear. Maybe it's clear now. So I don't have too much of an opinion, only that it's in very early stage and, and it's got obviously potential to be really good. Uh, and it's got potential to be really bad, depending on what they come up with. Sorry, I can't be more specific. I think there's, there's one more question in the... Okay, so someone asked if the capability of the tax are holding it short of being able to replace governments, aren't we leaving the most important part out of the code base. Um, ah, okay, that's an interesting question. Well, that, 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 that's obviously a, a politically motivated question, right? So, 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 do you want to replace governments? Well, for some things you do. You certainly want governments, or most people would want governments with with certain limits of powers. So yes, we're leaving stuff out of the code base. Uh, again, this talk was just aimed at having a very practical example of the type of things we can do right now. There might be a lot of government services we can replace with this type of technology. We certainly want to be in charge of our data and give the governments just the data they need to give us the services we, we want them to do. Um, so that's a valid point, but, but yes. Uh, <laughs> Let's not get into a political debate about this. Another question here. Uh, what do you, do you think CK is the way to go? Yes, I mean, zero knowledge is, of course, the way to go for, for in many things. So, so zero knowledge proofs are the way to go for certain privacy preserving things. Like I would like to see zero knowledge authentication to be used much more. Even even you know even if you don't use a self sovereign identity framework below the hood, you, you can do things like there's a protocol for there are several protocols for identifying for proving that you know your password without sending it across the network. And and there's been uh, an official RFC for this for, for many years, and it's just not implemented a lot. So that, that's an obvious example where, where zero knowledge proofs make sense. Then there are other things where electronic signature is just enough. Or, well, in our, there's a debate how zero knowledge uh, standard signature is, and it obviously depends on the signature scheme you use. So for some things, we don't need all that extra uh, data leakage. We don't need to re re avoid that, uh, we can live with it uh, in order to have more efficient uh, signature schemes. And, and then obviously zero knowledge seems to be the way to go for things like scalability, right? Layer two. Um, layer two is obviously very important and zero knowledge uh, proofs much more complex than the ones I've demonstrated here are proving very useful. So yes, CK is definitely the way to go. And then there's another question here. Your opinion on government versus privacy around the world? Well, well again, I don't want to be drawn into a, a political debate, but my personal opinion, uh, certainly the part I'm happy to admit to on this open forum, is that, that we should have privacy up to a certain point and we should be in charge of our data. Now, there are certain moments in life, in real life, where we have to give up certain parts of our privacy to be able to do certain things. Uh, like, you know, someone getting a pilot license, I would certainly 
uh, you know, I, I certainly want them to be having to give up certain uh, details about themselves to the to the to the government. Um, but we shouldn't take that too far, and we should make sure that we are in charge of what we what we want to give out uh, as data, right? So we should be able to to decide. You know, if I don't want to say that I'm over 18, that's fine. If I don't want to prove that to someone, uh, that's my private choice. But then maybe I shouldn't be allowed to drive a car in certain countries and things like this. Right? So, so the decision, the decision should be up to us. That's my personal opinion, anyway. I don't want to go any further. I, I think that's it for for questions. Uh, okay. Uh, standardization. How's it going? Well, it's going fine. I, I, to, to, I have to admit, I, I stopped going to attending meetings of the W three three groups I was participating in, uh, just because uh, they 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 take a lot of time. And uh, but but as far as I can see, uh, there are very clever people from very important companies uh, collaborating. And like all standards, this takes some time, and we probably see implementations before the standard is finalized. Well, we're seeing that now. But yes, that's going well. Um, then there is is Estonia. I see Estonia has digital signature, digital citizenship. Yes, uh, that's quite useful, especially if you want to open a company in Estonia. <laughs> but um, it's not a, a decentralized identity, not safe sovereign. Uh, would you be willing to talk about how Picari and blockchains are similar related? Well, uh, blockchain implements a type of public key infrastructure. I mean, you can have a centralized public key infrastructure and decentralized public key infrastructure. A blockchain is just a type of public key infrastructure where where the the part where public keys are managed or, or visible, the, the registry uh, is, is, is decentralized. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the workshop. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, guys.